Hello everyone and welcome to the Scottish Wildlife Trust's 56th annual general meeting. This is the first time that we've held the AGM remotely. Such a big contrast to last year where we were welcomed by the Central Borders Group to Gala Shields and enjoyed a wonderful walk together along the river. This year is quite different. All of us in our living rooms and studies and kitchens up and down Scotland. But the very good aspect of it is we've got a record number of people registered to attend. Um, 80 people have registered and that's a real testimony to the support to the Trust from its members. So a really big thank you to everyone for taking the time to be part of this important meeting today. Last week, we had our National Members Day. We separated it um, from, from the AGM, and that was a huge success. And I know many of you attended that. And that similarly was done through this process. Before we start, I'm going to ask Rashir Shah, our Director of External Affairs, to quickly run through a few housekeeping matters um, to help the meeting run a bit more smoothly and to give us all a bit more guidance about how we can use the technology, how we can best use the platform that we have so that you can interact with the meeting and we can have a very successful AGM. Over to you, Rashir. Hello everyone, uh, just uh, a few notes just to be aware of. Firstly, I just want to remind everyone that this event is being recorded. Um, the formal proceedings are all being recorded. However, the question and answer session at the end will be a safe space where, uh, which, where the recording will be turned off. Can I also um, just double check a few things as well? Um, note that if your voice will appear on the recording if you ask a question verbally, so just be aware of that. Um, and uh, you'll also notice that we have a Q&A box, a Q&A button that will be either at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen. Please do use the Q&A, which is question and answer box, in order to type in any questions and answers, questions you might have during the session. You can type a question in at any point during the proceedings and uh, we will be able to like observe that and pick that up. You can also raise your hands, virtual hands, to speak, which you can do by clicking on the hand icon that you have, and that will give an indication that you're in, intended in speaking verbally, and uh, the chair will be able to indicate that. And if uh, we come to you, then we'll be able to, I would be able to unmute you, and you'll be able to speak. Um, we do have staff assigned as technical support. You'll see their names within the participants list on the panel as technical support. Please do message them if uh, you would like to uh, have any support. And also, please do at any point put some comments on the chat function and any responses or any thoughts you might have or any observations. Um, that chat function, you just need to make sure that you enable participants and attendees. There's two options there when you type a chat. It, by default, it's set to um, only the panelists, but if you change it to panelists and attendees, it'll go to everybody so everybody can see what you're, you're writing there. So uh, thank you very much for all of that. And I'm handing back to Linda now. So um, this is the uh, programme for today. We'll um, shortly just move into the formal annual general meeting. And then um, by about 11.30, we'll move into a question and answer session. And as um, Rashia said, um, if you could use the question and answer facility that you have to, to put down questions, then those are the questions that we'll be um, seeking to answer by panel at, at the end of the session once we're past the formal AGM. So please do use that facility. So let us move into the formal agenda for the AGM. Welcome to the 55th Annual General Meeting of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Um, this meeting provides you the opportunity to scrutinise and hear about the main business of the Trust, to influence its governance 
and to ask any questions you have about the running of our charity. The agenda is um, in front of you and um, we'll just work through that. So the first item are apologies. We have received a number of apologies and those have been noted. The next formal piece of business that we have to do is to approve the uh, minutes of the AGM last year, which we held on the 21st of September at the Harriet Walt campus in Gala Shields. The minutes have been made available in draft on the website. Does anyone wish to put forward any corrections? If not, could I have a proposer that we accept the minutes as a true record and please use the chat box to volunteer as a proposer. And I'm also going to need a seconder. Thank you. Derek Irving has proposed that we accept the moment, the uh, minutes and um, we've got lots of people who are happy to also um, propose, so I'll take Vicky Nash as the seconder. So Derek Irving as the proposer and Vicky Nash has seconded. Thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, senior management team have confirmed that there are no matters arising as a result of the minutes, which means that we now move on to the annual report and accounts. Um, this is for the year ending the 31st of March 2020 um, and obviously that was just when the, when the COVID situation was starting to develop. Um, so it's been um, a busy year but rather unusual towards the end. I'm very proud of the way in which the Trust has risen to the challenges. Um, I think as a as a group of, of, um, of staff and, and, and members and, and volunteers, we've showed great resilience and, and rigor. Um, I'd like to record my sincere thanks to Joe and the staff team for their very hard work and dedication in ensuring that the trust has weathered the initial storm at least um, caused by the pandemic. We all face a future that can seem a bit uncertain at the moment. Um, I know many charities are, are find, finding life challenging, but I am confident that the Trust is in good heart and has strong foundations. And this will carry us through whatever the coming weeks and months bring. As required by my role as chair, I have oversight of all the council committees and I have attended meetings of the Conservation Committee, the Finance and Audit Committees, the Nominations Committee. Um, we have a strong group of trustees and I'd like to record my personal thanks to my fellow trustees for their unwavering support and dedication and hard work over the last year. In terms of what the Trust has been doing, I'm now going to run through um, some of the trust key achievements over the last year, focusing on reserves and engagement. And then I'm going to ask Joe to give an overview around some of the policy and campaigning activities of, of the trust. So turning to reserves first, we have continued to protect our sites across Scotland, carrying out restoration work of habitats, control of invasive species. Um, but I particularly want to highlight the work of our flying flock and herd, which I know is of interest to, to many members. Um, we had a, a substantial enhancement of that feature um, over the last year. We had a hundred lambs who joined the flying flock in the spring and we now have a flock of nearly 300 and the flying herd has increased to 20. We've also been working on um, our path networks and the reserve team have upgraded staff, uh, have upgraded paths um, 
to enable people to enjoy nature um, with less disturbance. Um, there's a slide up of um, Shewalton Wood, where we had our first otter sighting in, in, in Ayrshire. Um, that was following a program of improvement to riparian habitat and naturalising the flow of the Dundalon burn. So excellent consequences of, of the work there. Turning to Montrose, we built and launched a new turn raft and we um, welcomed um, 66,000 pink-footed geese, which is an extraordinary sight. And I do urge you to go and see it if you haven't um, every year. Um, we celebrated 50 years of protecting wildlife at Loch of the Lows. Sadly, our ospreys were not quite as visible as you might have wished, but um, it was excellent to, to celebrate that um, level of protection that the charity has managed to provide over, over many decades. We um, worked at the Falls of Clyde um, with the charity Scottish Badgers on a new project on earning your stripes, building skills to championing wildlife. And that had a hundred skills development sessions targeted particularly at people who face barriers to environmental monitoring, um, people with learning difficulties, accessible and inclusive programs. And the idea behind all of these is to support people to develop transferable skills. Moving on to Jupiter, um, this was, I, I I've attended Jupiter and at one of their training sessions, I did a bit of work on moth identification and I recognize how challenging it is. So very pleased to report that for the first time, we recorded the older signal moth in Scotland at Jupiter. Um, and this is um, a species that's largely in the south of England. So quite significant to have identified it and recorded it for the first time in Scotland. Jupiter uh, has been hard at work in previous years as well um, in discovering new Scottish species. And in, 2018, um, they found a, an endangered leaf beetle, um, the Bromius obscurus. Um, so again, um, highlighting the excellent identification skills and, and work of the Jupiter Center. Turning to wider aspects of um, engagement, Wildlife Watch continues to be a big part of our work. Uh, there are now 31 wildlife watch groups and we've successfully launched a new award, the ECHO Award. And you'll see some of our participants on the screen. In Ayrshire, we have um, established the second phase of the Irvine to Girvan ne Nectar Network, which uh, aims to establish nectar and pollen rich sites along the Ayrshire coast. And we've got businesses, golf clubs, local authorities, um, people all working together to provide land, materials, expertise to tackle the issue. And it also provides volunteering opportunities and gives people in Ayrshire an opportunity to be involved in something tangible to protect the environment. It's an excellent program. Overall, more broadly, we've provided 28,000 inspiring interactions with the natural world through our education and events. Volunteering is at the heart of trustees' activities and we've logged over 5,000 volunteer days on reserves. And that contribution that volunteers make, and I know many members volunteer, is a vital element in the management of our 116 wildlife reserves. We've worked with our young leaders to launch a pilot of the new conservation award scheme. That's a brand new initiative to develop skills and experience to help young people gain paid employment in conservation. Our aim for that is to it to become a recognized and valuable program that helps people 
develop skills to gain paid employment. And we're looking to see that being recognised by employers outside of conservation and enable the award winners to become champions for nature inside and outside the workplace. So that's a very impressive um, workload that the Trust has achieved thanks to your support over the last year. I'm now going to hand over to Joe to take through even more activities um, in the field of policy and advocacy and some of our major programmes. Thanks very much Linda. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you. And hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, I also remember fondly the event last year in, in Gala Shields. It feels like a memory from a different age, so much has changed. And of course, not just on a practical front. At this time last year, we were all looking forward to the, the so-called super year, which this year was supposed to be for the environment with um, you know, big international conferences, how much changes in, in such a short space of time. Um, I'm really, really pleased that 80 people are here today, by the way. I know I can't see you, but it's lovely to think that we can still all get together on Zoom. And, you know, it has had a few upsides. We've realised that we can reach new people. We can be inclusive in different ways. Not everybody is able to travel for a variety of reasons. Um, so thank you if you're joining us here, particularly if you've never actually joined an AGM before. So I'm going to go through um, a few of the um, further achievements from the last year, as Linda mentioned, focusing largely on our policy and advocacy work and some of our major projects. But I've decided to show these through the lens of our six core values at the Trust. And one of our core values is that we are pioneers. And perhaps there's no better example of that than our work um, to bring beavers back to Scotland after an absence of 400 years. And most of you will be very well aware that we celebrated this huge milestone last year back in in May when beavers were finally given um, legal protection in Scotland and uh, we went on uh, to win the Species Champion Award at the Nature Scotland Awards later in the year. I think this just goes to show that, that 25 years of work um, is really worth it. Clearly we hope that not everything else is going to take quite so long but you know you can be very proud of being part of the trust which is a, a true pioneer in this area and it was the first time that uh, a mammal had ever been reintroduced to the UK as part of a formal scientific trial. Now another way in which we were um, pioneering last year um, was in our approach to our advocacy work around green and blue infrastructure and in fact we secured a, a groundbreaking amendment to the Planning Act which saw natural infrastructure for the first time recognised as part of our national infrastructure. So in other words, parks, woodlands, green spaces, rivers, um, all recognised as something that require proper planning and ultimately proper investment. Jumping forward then um, to May of this year, when all of us were in, in lockdown, Another example of the Trust being pioneering was when we published our route map to a billion pounds. Now, uh, those of you who are at the National Members Day last Saturday will remember this and some of you came to the, the breakout group. It does feel a little bit odd to be doing it in reverse order this year. We normally have everything in the, the same day and first of all we look backward and then we look forward, but we're doing it the other way around this time. I think it's fair to say that the, the Trust and CEPA who co-led this project we're really looking to pioneer in this, this new emerging field, pioneer these new ideas in Scotland, but really by bringing together lots of different um, stakeholders. So we even set up a network called the Scottish Conservation Finance Pioneers. Now, a second one of our six core values at the Trust is that we collaborate. And I think it's fair to say that across all of our major projects, they're, they're all collaborative. Our three living landscapes projects are a brilliant example of this and I'm sure you'll guess that um, this is from the northwest of Scotland, our Coech Atent living landscape, where last year we demonstrated, uh, we, we established um, rather two demonstration crofts. Um, we also grew 45,000 native trees at our, our little Atent tree nursery um, and sadly we had to remove over a tonne of marine litter 
um, as part of our, our range of activities. Meanwhile, in Edinburgh, um, in the Living Landscape Project, this is a great example of, of collaboration where we employed an ecologist to work with the City of Edinburgh Council. There's a project called Thriving Green Spaces and our ecologist, Donya, is working directly with the council um, developing what's called an ecological coherence plan. So in other words, about improving the quality of green spaces and making sure that they're better connected. And finally, in our Cumbernauld living landscape, we planted over 5,000 trees last year and also hundreds of square metres of wildflower meadow as part of the new phase of that project. Now, of course, we collaborate in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and this was uh, another example from last year where we collaborated with Scottish Environment Link on an award-winning short film called This is Scotland. And the purpose was really to, to highlight the fact that less funding comes to the natural environment in Scotland um, than it does in other parts of the UK from a variety of funders. So as well as being pioneering and collaborative, we're also very focused on impact, of course. And last year we celebrated 10 years of leading the Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels project in Scotland. And to mark that, we launched our new national citizen science campaign called the Great Scottish Squirrel Survey. Personally, I think this is a brilliant example of where we're really demonstrating impact on the ground and red squirrels have been seen to return to areas where they've not been for a very long time. Now, some of you will recognise this beautiful photograph as cool links in Sutherland. And I think this is, is probably one of the best examples of, of the trust being very focused and having to concentrate limited resources on issues of national significance where we know that sadly we don't have the capacity to deal with every planning application that might have an impact on nature but this one was so important and this is an internationally protected site it's got multiple levels of designation it's basically one of the most protected places on the planet but was at risk of, of being largely destroyed by a proposed golf course so the trust played a major role in a, a significant partnership campaign to prevent this and we were delighted at the beginning of this year when the Scottish Government uh, took the decision to, um, to protect cool links and not allow the golf course to, to proceed because they, they agreed with us that the biodiversity value was more important than any short-term localised economic gain. Now of course we're always really mindful about impact when we're using the money that comes to us from our members and for our supporters and last year we were we were very honoured to receive over 1.7 million pounds in gifts from Wills. So this picture that you see is uh, an example of how a previous legacy gift enabled us enabled us to build a new circular path. This is at our Sheen Wood Wildlife Reserve, and it's allowed visitors to better experience this beautiful ancient woodland. So fourth of our six core values is that we're evidence based. And of course, we have to focus on evidence-based arguments in our policy advocacy work. And last year, after the First Minister declared a climate emergency, we launched our Nature's Emergency Service campaign. And that highlights the contribution that nature-based solutions can make to addressing the climate crisis and, of course, the biodiversity crisis as well. And in terms of climate change, this is not just about locking away and storing carbon, but also about helping us to adapt to the effects of climate change for example, by giving us better flood protection. Uh, now, this slide is about our Living Seas work, um, which was uh, bigger uh, last year than it ever has been, and, and it continues to, to operate at that level. So we, we celebrated that at a, an event at the Scottish Parliament at the beginning of this year. That was to mark the beginning of the year of coasts and waters. That's fortunately going to run on until next year, so that, that will be extended, I'm pleased to say. But in terms of being evidence-based, again, some of you who were um, at the event last week will remember I mentioned that our Oceans of Value project, which is based in Orkney, is looking at two different kinds of evidence. So we're using something called the community voice me method to gather users' local stakeholders, and we'll compare and contrast that with evidence uh, gathered through a more economically focused natural capital assessment. And they're both looking at the value of our marine environment, and we will use the evidence there to inform um, decision makers about future marine planning. Um, we also extended our network of snorkel trails um, and launched one in Berwick last year. 
Now, the penultimate uh, value is something that I think should go without saying, really, which is that we act with integrity. Um, but what does that mean in practice? Well, one example is that we need to recognise as a charity um, that we have a carbon footprint. We're not yet a zero waste organisation. We have impacts on the environment that we need to deal with. Um, and we're always looking at how we can do that. So last year, you'll see here in Cumminalls, we purchased our first electric vehicle. Um, we also redesigned all of our species adoption packs um, and launched uh, a new plastic free series, which has been really popular, I'm pleased to say. Um, and we installed a more sustainable water source heat pump at our Falls of Clyde Visitor Centre. And that brings me to my last um, of our core values, and I don't have any slides to go with this one. I think this is probably my favourite one of all, which is that we are always learning. And this is, this is true across everything we do, but of course never more over the last six months where everybody in the whole world has been thrown into this very new situation. And the Trust has had to learn not only how to move events like this one online and support local groups to use technology um, in different ways, but also how to run our visitor centres completely differently and deal with problems on, on our reserves. I mean, on the, on the ground, sadly, we've had to deal with everything from additional fly tipping to illegal raids. And, you know, that's also about learning from other organisations in the sector and um, from some of the national parks and government agencies. So you've heard me talk about resilience before. I think the importance of the fact that we always feel like we're learning is that we do need to be adaptive. Um, not just in the current time, but as we look to the future um, and tackle these big environmental challenges and, and step up to that, that challenge with, with all of our members together. So thank you very much, um, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and look forward to some questions later on. Um, thank you. Joe, and, and thank you for that. Um, I mean, a, a hugely impressive range of, of work. Um, and it happens because of, of you, because of the members, um, all those who've supported the Trust through um, volunteering, through financial giving, and through just being a member. Um, that's what makes all this impressive work happens. And hugely important for Scotland and for Scotland's environment. And you should be very proud of, of, of what you do um, to support and ensure that the Trust continues in its work. So a very, very big thank you. Um, we have so much to be proud of. And Council, the staff team, um, a big, huge thank you to, to everyone for, for your generous support. Um, it, is, it is much appreciated. As Joe ran through, um, you will have seen topics you're interested in, things that you might be interested in knowing about. You may have questions about the work of the Trust. Please do use the question and answer function if you've got a question that you'd like to have addressed later when we move into the panel session. And please use the chat function if you've got a comment that you want, you want to make. Um, I, I see we've got our first question on the Q&A, which is great. Um, we've got, um, what, 63 participants? So, um, hugely impressive range of, of folk involved. Please do use the technology that's available to us to, to make this an interactive and involving event, despite the fact that we can't do what we would normally do if we're actually together. Um, please do use those facilities. Um, I know it will be in your minds that given the current uncertainties that um, finance is, is, is an issue for all charities. So we're now going to move on to the um, financial position of the trust. Um, and I also want to formally thank all our funders and, and partners for their continued and impressive support for our work. So um, Susan McKenzie, our Director of Finance and Resources, is going to summarise the current financial position. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you here with us this morning. Um, I'm reporting on the results for the year ended 31st of March 2020. Um, the charity reported an excellent result 
um, last financial year. Um, in terms of income, the Trust remains hugely grateful for the support of its members through subscriptions and donations. And we were also honoured to receive um, 1.7 million in legacy income during the financial year. Grant funders also continue to support the Trust, giving over £2.7 million. Pounds. And overall total charity income remains steady at, um, at over £7 million. Restricted income also remains strong in that financial year, uh, around £3.5 million. Pounds. That was a, a bit of a fall from the previous financial year, um, mainly due to the fact that legacy income um, was decreased um, restricted legacy income was decreased in that financial year. And I'd, I'd remind you that restricted income can and is only used for the particular purposes specified by the donors. Um, restricted income in 2019-20 um, supported existing commitments such as Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels, the Coyach Ascent Living Landscape, Living Seas, Oceans of Value, and the Creating Natural Connections project in Cumbernauld. The Trust also is in the process of developing projects, both to ensure good succession planning for the existing projects, but also to achieve our longer term aspirations and vision. Our unrestricted income was also strong, uh, around £3.6 million, pounds, and that was an increase on um, the income in 2018-19, due predominantly to, to that generous legacy income. Um, which included an amount of a million pounds which received, was received um, in mid-March, um, just as um, the, the pandemic was taking hold. So that, that has provided a, a, a great source of income and assurance for the Trust. Turning to expenditure, our, our expenditure increased by around £770,000 to just shy of £6 million. Pounds. As you'd expect, there's, there's some variations in expenditure in restricted activity because by its very nature, it's project driven um, and that accounts for most of the increase. Looking at the accounts themselves, um, 2020 saw a significant change in the way that we account for the pension scheme in order to adhere to the accounting method required by the, the SORP, the Statement of Recommended Practice. The, we were subject to a, a defined benefit scheme, and that was a multi-employer scheme uh, as part of the, the wildlife trusts. Previously, the scheme was unable to recognize its specific share of scheme assets and liabilities, and therefore included a liability in the balance sheet equal to the net present value of future deficit reduction payments. In conjunction with um, RSWT, an actuary was appointed and that allows us to now identify our share of the scheme assets and liabilities from the 1st of April 2019. That valuation was then ruled forward to present a position as at the 31st of March 2020. In the accounts during the year, the deficit that was previously recognised of one and a half million pounds was de-recognised and the net defined benefit pension scheme liability of 569,000 was then recognised at the year end and included in the provisions for pension liability in the financial statements. So we've seen um, a, a difference um, recognised in the net movement of funds of £815,000. There's been discussion of that at Council and we don't think it's a fair reflection of the liability due to the requirements to continue to make payments towards the pension fund. And as a result, the pension liability is now recognised within designated funds to make sure that we think that it provides a true and fair view. The end result at the financial year um, showed an increase of 1.3 million against unrestricted reserves and an increase of 623,000 in restricted reserves. That was quite an exceptional result for the trust and it means that our free funds are now above the target range set by council. Having said that, that additional headroom has provided a great deal of reassurance to the Trust as we enter and continue to be in a period of great financial uncertainty, particularly to do with COVID-19, but, but also facing other financial risks. Um, we, we set, or Council agreed an initial budget and that was subsequently revised um, to deal with the, the emerging COVID situation. 
um, and that became a significant deficit budget recognizing the increased financial risks. Um, impacts on the trust financially include the visitor center closures, the inability to hold events. Um, the impact of um, our, uh, the cessation of face-to-face -face member recruitment um, and all that means for engaging with new members as well. Um, we also face drops in investment income and uh, risks associated with economic trends, um, indeed, you know, entering a recession, what the impacts may be for giving and attrition. And we're also looking at impacts on funders and grant allocation. So whilst, whilst the, the free reserves are high, it will help to um, sustain the, the Scottish Wildlife Trust through this period of financial um, uncertainty. Looking at the balance sheet, as, as I've inferred, balance sheet remains strong um, and year on year, although the investment portfolio decreased um, only by a, a, around 100,000 year on year, um, it did re represent a significant drop in investment values um, during the year. Um, last year, my closing words to the AGM were that there would always be uncertainties and the financial results provided a sound foundation. Um, due to the pandemic, we, we are in choppy waters at the moment, but I would assure the members this morning that trustees and staff continue to proactively manage the activities and finances of the Scottish Wildlife Trust to allow us to achieve our long-term vision to advance the conservation of Scotland's biodiversity for the benefit of present and future generations. And that would not be possible without the continued support from our members, our funders and our supporters. And we remain grateful to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, as you say, a, a picture in which um, the trust is in, is in a good position, but there are undoubted challenges ahead. And the trustees are certainly very mindful of the need to uh, look carefully at these issues. And, and from um, the, the first council meeting in, in March, where it was obvious what the situation um, was, was going to be difficult, um, we have acted to safeguard the trust position and ensure that um, there is active um, and robust engagement on the financial matters so that we continue to be in as good a position as possible in, in the months and years ahead. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think there's at least one question on the finances, um, which you maybe want to have a look at. But if other people have questions on the finances, please do put it in the question and answer. Um, and, and we'll come back to that later. So that takes us to the next item on the agenda, which is the reappointment of the auditors. Um, RSM have audited the trust for three years now, and a comprehensive audit finding was provided to the Finance and Audit Committee and subsequently to Council. The audit was um, robust and, and rigorous as normal, but it went smoothly and no cause for concern was highlighted. And that does provide us with the assurance that the finances continue to be well managed. And our particular thanks to Susan for her work in this area. Council therefore proposes the reappointment of RSM as auditors. And as before, um, we need to use the technology to invite a proposer and a seconder from the membership for this role. So could folk use the chat facility? And um, could I have a proposer and a seconder, please? Um, and there's also a query about someone who can't see the link who's put that up. Um, Amanda Forsyth has proposed and Karen Chambers has seconded. Thank you all very much and thank you, Susan. So that takes us on to the next item of business, which is the formal council election. At this point, I'd like to hand over to Nikki Munro, who is the convener of our nominations committee. And she will um, take forward the issues arising from uh, the council and, and trustees. Over to you, Nikki. 
Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, I've got no slides on this one. Um, I'm going to be announcing some new council members shortly. But first, I thought maybe we owed you a little bit of an account about our council. It's your council and we're representing uh, your interests. And um, I know sometimes councils ruling governing bodies can seem very distant. So just a little bit about us and what we do. Uh, first thing is that we're all trust members. Uh, second is that we all live in Scotland. And the third is that we are all volunteers, part of the great swathe of trust volunteers who uh, tend our estates and raise money and work with children and uh, get in the way of um, the kind of developments that we don't want on our natural sites. So, uh, um, but that's very important to us and we are all very committed to the trust and um, very passionate, I think, uh, about wildlife and uh, biodiversity and tackling climate change. We are quite a mixed bunch, I have to say. Uh, we've got backgrounds varying in conservation, as you'd expect, in finance, in law, farming, um, government policy and campaigning. And that's really a big asset in council meetings because often we're addressing quite complicated topics um, and they do need looking at from all angles and you can see that happening a lot in meetings uh, but it's very enjoyable bouncing uh, these perspectives off each other and I think we probably all learn quite a lot from our times in council for that. Uh, why do we need a governing council? Well um, Scotland has very strong um, charity laws and regulation, we're a sizeable charity so you know, the simple answer is yes, there has to be a council uh, we're not managing day-to-day -day performance. We've got a wonderful staff and uh, um, it's my chance to pay tribute to them before I move on. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to be accountable for the performance and the integrity of the staff, uh, sorry, of the council and the um, trust itself. Um, both those words are very important, I think, performance and integrity. Um, how are we sort of applying that? Well, Susan's just talked about the uh, council um, role in finances. Uh, we're drawing in money from many sources. We're investing it to try to grow it and we're spending it. Um, so it's very important that the council is signing off, understanding and checking that everything is going well. Um, it's our job to question, um, future budgets and we do that quite a lot to make sure that we understand all the implications. Uh, the auditors come and present to us their findings, uh, usually uh, very reassuring findings, I'm glad to say, um, and then it's for us to sign off the re big report that comes out saying what we've done during the year, uh, which is available to all of you and gives an account of, of what we're about. Um, we're not just looking at money, of course. Um, there are lots of um, regulations and standards that apply to the varied work we do. Um, and these apply to how we manage our reserves, how we work with children, how we raise funds, how we employ staff, think health and safety, and how we manage data. So again, we're not managing these in directly or writing them, but we have to assure ourselves that these policies are all there and that they're being effective. And a third area where we're very active is in relation to um, strategic policy, I guess. You could describe it that way. Last October, we got together with Joe and her senior team and we spent quite a lot of time scoping for the next five year um, program. Uh, and we were asking quite hard questions about where we were going, where is the impact, how do we raise the resources, is it about doing the same things or are we thinking uh, in more original ways. And we're going back to that I think in October for a similar session and then you'll be hearing more about the five year programme after that as we consult further. We also uh, critique ourselves from time to time um, using Scotland's uh, code of uh, voluntary 
government practice. Um, and we had some sessions where we divided into small groups, said how effective are we being? And we explored some areas we hadn't a lot on before, for instance, on transparency and diversity. And we've got work proceeding really to in these areas too. Um, how do we actually work? Well, we've got four formal council meetings a year and in between that, uh, I think everyone is a member of at least one committee and some of us are members of two. Um, and we also have, in addition to those committees, which are finance, conservation and nominations, which is a mixture of membership and governance issues. We also have, of course, a, a, a vice chair for watch and groups. And those of you who uh, attended our members day a week ago uh, will have seen Karen um, compared that who, and who is very active in relating to organisations around Scotland, um, as is our chair who spends a lot of attention in that area. Um, Covid has changed the way we work a bit. Um, suddenly we went to virtual meetings and so we had uh, faces and voices bouncing from the Black Isle to Arran to Duns to Carnwath, um, Falkirk and back to Edinburgh so it's a different way of working and at a time when we needed to pay quite a lot of extra attention to council business particularly on the financial side as the Covid impact started to bite. So that gives us, I think, some flavour of how we work, but I'm happy for questions and answers later. Uh, and it brings me naturally to leavers and joiners on the council. Um, the first and very important step in December was that the council members um, decided unanimously that they would very much like Linda to continue as chair for a second three-year term and fortunately when we put the invitation to her she said yes um, and we were very pleased because of the vast experience and skills uh, she has brought with her to the post of chair and certainly in uncertain times continuity and people who are up to full pitch and have good networks and so on we all feel that are uh, it's important to have some um, really at the top of our game. Two members are leaving today, our council, and I want to thank them. Firstly, uh, Amanda Forsyth, who has chaired our finance committee with immense skill and experience and good humour uh, for the last uh, six years, which is a long sentence. Um, we shall miss her a lot, but I know her heart will still be with us. And our second lever is Andrew Binney, um, who is a, a clearly addicted to islands, I think, because he worked a good deal on egg and is currently based in Arran. Um, and he has brought to our council an enormous knowledge about coastal and marine issues, um, which is a good thing because we're doing a lot more work these days in these areas. So, Andrew, we're sorry to say goodbye to you, but it's not a full goodbye because uh, Andrew has very kindly consented to be um, an external member on our Conservation Committee going into the future, so we still can access those skills. So, now that brings me to two new members of the Council. Uh, back in the spring, when we looked at the coming forth, forthcoming pattern of retirement um, to our strength, we realised that we were lose, going to lose quite a few uh, conservation experts. So when we came out to the membership in the spring, through our magazine and our website, saying, would you like to apply and join the council? Uh, we did give quite a strong steer, saying we really uh, would welcome people who know about wildlife. And uh, that has worked uh, beautifully because we've had uh, four very high quality applications or nominations. Um, and we have counted the votes as of yesterday. 
and I can now uh, reveal uh, our new members who are uh, Emma Steele. Um, Emma has a farming background but she's also worked in um, quite a number of wildlife organizations. She's got, got a first degree in zoology and a master's in conservation. Um, and she's in a post currently where she is advocating uh, for wildlife for a rural organization. So it's hard to think of anyone better qualified to join us. Welcome, Emma. Um, and our second successful candidate is Alistair Lemon. Uh, those with sharp eyes and the ears may remember a week ago uh, when we announced our volunteering awards and Alistair actually uh, was, uh, was our young volunteer of the year. So uh, that's going to give him a very good start, I think, in, in uh, joining our council. And he too has a first and second degree in environmental work and has been extraordinarily active across a whole range of, uh, of um, uh, wildlife uh, bodies, including bug life, frog life, um, and is currently working uh, with the RSPB uh, on the West Coast. So there we are. Um, much as we welcome their wildlife experience, um, we're also welcoming their youth. Uh, there's a tendency for charity boards to age and for us looking into the future with um, all the environmental issues ahead and thinking um, how hard these will bite on our children and grandchildren it's really important that we're able to engage now with uh, young people so many of whom are living in cities we've seen how young people can be mobilized but for us, it's really important to engage, listen, and use um, often methods of contact which uh, might be a little foreign, to be honest, to some older members of the council, uh, but work very well if you know what they are. So, um, so this is a, a, a great, um, I think, an improvement that we've extended our age diversity. Um, and the two people that are joining us have both been very active um, in our Young Leaders Programme. Uh, so they've already been thinking a lot about our policies and where we should be going. Uh, and they're going to really hit the ground running. Right, so thank you very much. And back to Linda. Thank you, Nikki, and warm congratulations to Emma and Alistair, and we'll, I'll very much look forward to working with you as trust, fellow trustees and, and members of council. Um, and I'd like to echo also Nikki's um, sentiments regarding our two departing trustees. It's been a great pleasure working with, with both, and the support has been absolutely invaluable, You've made huge contributions, so thank you, thank you very, very much. And very sorry to, to, to see you go. Um, I'll also mention at this point that we do have the question and answer um, capability. We do now have um, three questions, I think, have been asked. Oh, no, five questions. We have five, um, five questions. Um, if you look at the questions, if you've not opened that facility, um, you'll see that there's a little grayed out hand in the in the left hand side that gives you an opportunity if you're not asking a question to sort of upvote the one that you'd like to see answered so if some of those questions seem to you to be particularly ones that you'd be interested in hearing answered then do give them a vote and the idea is the ones with the most votes tend to drift upwards and when i try and chair the the, the q a session i'll be giving some weight to that so please do take a look at the q a session and to add to the questions around the work of the trust arising from um, Joe's presentation or, or, the, or the few um, areas that I covered, um, if you've got governance questions or finance questions coming out of Susan's or Nikki's presentations, now's your chance to, to get those questions down so we can have a truly interactive session with our members. So we are now approaching the end of the um, formal uh, part of the AGM. 
The last item is any other business and no notification was received of any other formal business. So um, I will therefore now formally close the 2020 annual general meeting. And that means the recording will now stop at this point. Linda, can we just very quickly come to Susan? She's got one point that she needs to make. Susan. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks to Amanda for Scythe who um, noticed that the wrong slide was shown for um, the financial results. Um, it was last year's information that was shown on that screen um, rather than 1920. But I was talking to the 1920 results, not um, 1819. Um, I was wondering why the, the figures didn't tie up to what was on screen. So apologies for that. So will you be able to put up the correct slide, um, Susan? Um, it would take a few minutes to find that. I... If it was possible to do that during the course of the meeting, I think that would be useful if we could. Okay, I'll, I'll sort it out. So um, let's move on to the question and answer. Um, we have a panel of 